All right, so here we are. I've been noticing that some people are actually watching the videos online. I think that's great. Um, nominate me for an Emmy. Wow. Wow. Oh, my God. I notice I have like five subscribers, and one of them is not a student. So <laughs> I'm like, maybe somebody at some other school is like, man, I need help. <laughs> no, no, no. No, one guy actually re um, recognized me as the guy who made the video of the eclipse. And I'm like, wow, somebody actually remembered. Uh, my fans. Yeah, my fans. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. But. Right. Yeah. All right, so um, we need to talk about um, derivatives of inverses. Okay. All right, so. Um, uh -uh. Okay, so um, the notation for an inverse, I want to make sure that everybody is like getting this notation under control. Um, if f of x is my function, then the inverse of that function is f to the negative 1x. This is not an exponent. It's a superscript. Okay, It's a diacritic. Dia meaning around. Okay. Um, so it's something that you write around the word. All right. And we, you've done inverses back in algebra two, and you know probably even before, you know, around that maybe even in algebra one, um, where an inverse. And we have to talk about for a moment about what is an inverse. And Inverse, we all know how to take one. You know, you, you swap x and y, and then you solve for y again, right? But why? Why do you do that? <sighs> why, why, why? Um, the reason why you do it is because y equals x is its own inverse. Okay? It is its own inverse. And it is one of a very, very small few are their own inverses. Okay. Um, another one is that one. Swap x and y and solve for y, you get the same thing back out again. Okay. Very small group of functions that does this. They are what are called self-orthogonal. That's a great. Um, Oh, it's orthogonal, meaning that always normal to itself. Um, self inverses. Now, um, when we do this, let's take a look at an example and see what happens at the slope, if we can generalize an idea behind the slope of the derivative, uh, the slope of the inverse. So let's take a function y equals, all right, and we take the inverse of that. Right? And we graph the two of these. And for the moment, I'm only going to care about the positive root. All right? Now, at the point, let's take an example point. Point two four lies on that curve. You square two, you get four. Right. Now, the inverse point for this would be four two. Right. Where basically what I'm doing is I am reflecting this curve and that point about the line y equals x. 
Okay. If I took that and flipped it about that line, um, you know, use that as the as the mirror. That's what you would wind up getting. Okay. And this point and this point are one one. Because again, if you take that x and that y and you swap them, you get the same point is what on that line. So if I'm looking for the point 2, 4 here, I um, can't really see it very well, but I'll see if I can make it prettier. 2, 4 might be there. If I flip that and take that inverse, that point now pops up over here. You see how that works? So I'm just kind of watching as a curve inverts and following the point along the way. All right. Go ahead and take the derivative of y equals x squared. Find me the actual slope and take the, squ um, the square root, uh, the derivative of inverse and find me the slope at those two points if you wouldn't mind. Take this. Find me the slope at that point for both functions. Oh no, two four and four two. No, just four two. Just four. Oh no, all I care about is the positive one. Yeah. It doesn't live on the other. So what's the slope for the left-hand curve? 4. And the slope for the right-hand curve? 1, 4. Are you entirely surprised by that? Not really. But it's interesting to point out that when we take this swap of left and right, you know, x and y, my slopes become reciprocals. So we can generalize this. That the derivative of the inverse, right? What do you think that's going to be? Well, we just did it, actually. We started with the first one. When we took the derivative of the function, f of x, and we took its derivative, okay, at a given point, we got 4. And then when we took the derivative of the inverse, we got 1 fourth. So how the two related. Right. They're reciprocal. One over the derivative of the function. Um, and now I can go ahead and I can kind of um, I can kind of simplify this. Actually, hold on, I want to make sure we get everything this right. Yeah, it's the reciprocal function's value. So let's see if I can get this cleaned up a little bit better. Right, 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 right. I want to make sure I got my notation right. I have to make a mistake. No, I was right. No. No. I use a library of different books. Um, and in fact, we can write this as 1 over the derivative of the inverse of b. The derivative of 
So I take my derivative, so I have my inverse function, and that value gets plugged into the derivative and then invert it. Let's look at an example that you're used to. All right. Uh, the square root function. All right. If f of x equals x squared, okay. The der the inverse is the square root of x. And its derivative is 2x. True? So, if we use this, if we want to find the derivative of the inverse, let's predict it. Okay. So I have so 1 all over f prime of f inverse of x would be, and I'm going to run out of room here, okay, now f inverse of x would be, f inverse of x is the square root of x, and f prime is 2x. is what you actually get. Yes. Say that again. True. Okay. Um, think about what function notation is really saying. If I see if f of x equals 3x squared minus 4, f of 5, uh, ugly 5, yeah, f of 5 would mean just take that 5 and plug it in, right? If you had f of dog, you would get 3 dog squared minus 4. So whatever you have just gets stuck in there and played with. So f, yeah, in this case, f prime is the function that multiplies things by 2. Oh, so it's like, okay, now I get it. Okay. Whatever x is, if it's f of a, it would be 2a. It's like, no, kind of like after that, and then you do like f with like 5, so you plug in 5 for x. Kind of like that. Right, kind of like that, right. Okay. So if we look at the function x squared, okay, and we take a derivative of its inverse, that's what we get. So this is a simple and small little example, but we're going to use it to get the inverses of some other things that are actually much more useful. Where do we see function inverses all the time? Mm hmm Yeah. I mean, but not just, op um, not just there, not just in your standard arithmetic. What other subject of mathematics uses inverses all the time? Trig. of trig functions and their derivatives. Trig is one of my favorite subjects in that. If anybody, if, if anybody's interested in a really cool IA, spherical trigonometry. Like trig on a sphere. That's when, you know, like all of a sudden triangles have, you know, more or less angles than, 100, than 180. 
and think about it. If you're talking about, say, looking up at the heavens and you know moving uh, an object across the sky and finding angles on in the heavens, you're talking about spherical trick. And and if you can imagine, people were doing that on a rickety old wooden boat traveling across the Atlantic or other ocean by candlelight in a storm when their life depended upon it. Not quite sure. I've heard the word, but I'm not familiar. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, sine of x, we're going to go through these. So, yeah. So, if f of x equals the sine of x, okay, f inverse is the arc sine. And its derivative, derivative of sine is cosine of x. Okay. Hmm. So now let's apply that, the, the previous rule that we got. F inverse of x. F inverse of x would give me, so I have 1 all over F inverse, which is sine in, sine in arc sine of x. And I'm taking that, and I'm plugging it in to cosine of x. Yeah, that's ugly. That's enough. Now, what in the heck is that? That's an ugly steaming pile of trig. No, it's not an exponent. It is not an exponent. Right. And I just want to make sure that everybody's nice and happy. Nice. So this is an unsteaming pile of math. And let's see at this. We'll come back to it. Y equals the sine of X. Let's do implicit differentiation. Well, we need to find sine inverse, right? That's really what we're looking for. So let's do this. I just took the arc sine of both sides. The arc sine is the inverse of the sine. It's the thing that undoes the sine. If you think about a square and a square root oh, yeah. as opposite operators, if I square a square root, they go, they both go away. No, 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 no. The, the cosecant is the reciprocal. Think about it this way. Okay, think, think about it this way, Fatima. Just don't panic for a second. If you wanted, if you wanted to get x alone, okay, sine is an operator. What all operators do is they take in a number, spin it around, and spit something out, okay? A square root takes in a number, plays around with it, spits something out, okay? If I want to get rid of x, sorry, to get x alone and get rid of the sine, I have to do something that undoes the sine, okay? I can't just say that, you know, if 4 is equal to the square root of x, okay, I can't just say, I can't, how about something simple like this? I can't do this. <laughs> All right? <laughs> this doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't do that, okay? Um, <laughs> some people would really like to be able to do that, but no, you can't do that. So we have to find a way to undo the square root, Real, I mean, like, in reality. Okay, and the way to do that is to apply an operator, an, the inverse operator to both sides. 
and the and the inverse operator is the square. Okay. That's really what's happening. So in here, what's really happening is this. I'm using the arc sign down. You're applying an op you're applying an operator. It's like squaring or square rooting it. it Different than the secant and cosecant and cotangent. Those are the reciprocal. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so, do we understand how all of these play together? All right, so what I really want to do, what I really want to do is find out what, what is the derivative of arc sine. So we're going to look at y equals the arc sine of x. Because this is really what we want to know, right? We want to know what the derivative of that function is. So we do this. Dang. Thank you. No. Go away. Better. So now we apply that rule before, but now we're going to do the sign. You see? And now we get this. You're never, ever going to have to write this step down. But it's there so that you can understand that what an inverse does, what an inverse is. All right, so now we've got this, which is equivalent to the step before it, uh, to the top step. And now we're going to take a derivative of both sides. So the derivative of x is just 1. And now the derivative of sine is cosine. And now we take the derivative of the thing inside it, which is y prime. And I should be more careful. Actually, there is a function out there called the hyperbolic cosine. And it's written hyperbolic cosh. That's how they pronounce it. <laughs> now, okay, so what we really want now is y prime. But we don't want it in terms of y. We want it in terms of x. Okay? And look what happens if I immediately substitute, which I'm not going to go through, but I'm going to show you. Don't write this down. And isn't that what we saw this just a minute ago? That horrible evil thing? Uh, there. Ugh. Gross. But we get the same thing back out again. Now, let's see if we can figure out a way to make this thing look a little bit more normal. Does anybody remember the Pythagorean identity in trig? Yes. The Pythagorean identity. There was really only one. Remember that? That's the Pythagorean identity. Yeah, well, there was one for secants and, uh, and tangents and stuff. Right. But they're all basically based off of this. So we can write the analogous one. That's the analogous one. 
for y when I'm just replacing x with y. And what we want is the cosine of y. Find out something else for the cosine of y. So the cosine squared of y is 1 minus sine squared. OK. And now we take a square root. OK, so this is an equivalent form of cosine of y. But why do we even care? Because when I plug in y equals the arc sine of x, the sine and the cosine go away. Sorry, the, the sine and the sine inverse go away. See, by getting it away from cosine, which I didn't like, and going back to sine and sine inverse, this thing now collapses. Do you see how it fell apart? Yeah. Well, because um, what I really have is this. When I say sine squared of x, that's really saying is sine of x quantity squared. So when I plug in sine's uh, kryptonite, <laughs> okay, the sine and the arc sine fall apart, leaving me just the x. And then that's squared. It, it destroys itself from the inside, and then the x squared applies. So th this and this cancel out. which just gives me that. OK? Yeah, it destroyed it. It, it. it ate a big pile of kryptonite and was just not a happy camper after that. So now this becomes so the derivative of the arc cosine, the arc sine. Actually, I should keep it. I'll keep it. So now I can say that the arc sine Thank you, hold on. Thanks. Appreciate that. So the derivative of the arc sine is 1 minus x squared. So what do you think our cosine is going to be? <laughs> You're like, uh, uh, Ronka? Yeah, you are. All right, so how about this? We, yeah, we have enough time. Um, Did anybody even attempt those four, um, uh, those four functions I gave you the other day? No. No one tried. Aw. No, it was it was an optional assignment. It was just four problems for practice. Okay, that's no good. All right. Yeah, sure. I'll give you a point or two. Um, 
All right. Set y. I'm just going to go through this. Arc cosine of x. So the cosine of y is equal to x. Derivative of cosine is negative sine y. Y prime equaling 1. Y prime is equal to 1, negative 1 all over the sine of y. And if sine squared of y plus sin, uh, cosine squared is equal to 1, sine squared of y is equal to 1 minus cosine squared of y. Um, sine y is equal to square root 1 minus y uh, x squared. Mm -hmm. No. One's positive, one's negative. And I'll give you tangent. And of course, you have your reciprocals which would then just be the reciprocals of those. But, oh no, I, wouldn't, I shouldn't say that. We'll have to go into that a little bit later. It's going to get a little messy in a minute. Um, yeah. All right, I, I have enough. No, I don't. All right, we'll go into this uh, next class. Um, but I'll go into secant and all the other stuff. All right. Um, over the weekend, ladies and gentlemen, today's Thursday. Um, I am going to give you a related rate uh, problem set. I think you do need some practice in that. So keep your eyes posted in the next 24 hours for an assignment on the related rates. This episode of the Ronco Show has been brought to you by the Arc Secant and Arc Tangent.